started and you should put your headsets on. I'm go goodness. I'm going to get us started now. My name is Marilyn Cade. I'll be moderating this session, and I am going to ask those of you in the back of the room, if you don't mind, to move up a little bit closer. We'll have one speaker who will be arriving during the uh, meeting, and he'll just come and join us whenever he arrives. But let me kick this off. You will need your um, headsets, and uh, I'll um, leave the, we do have resources here in the room to help you if you have any problem. I also want to introduce to you our remote moderator, Janelle, and Janelle will be a virtual participant, uh, helping us to interact with our remote participants. So in getting started, I want to just review uh, the purpose of this workshop and lay out our, um, our plan for our time together. The title of the workshop is Internet Governance in a Sustainable World, and we are part of the theme on Internet Governance for Development, or IG4D. Many of you have been to multiple IGFs. This is the seventh IGF, and we are in the second year of the second five years of the IGF. The IGF was created by heads of state negotiated um, language that took place at the end of the uh, the uh, second phase of the World Summit on the Information Society. And the initially, the theme, Internet Governance for Development, was not part of the core themes that were agreed to uh, take place in the first few uh, IGF meetings. But it was really through the interest of the participants and the attendees who were coming to the IGF and participating in the open consultations that added this very important theme. And the reason I want to highlight that for all of us is we're talking about Internet governance for development. We're not specifically talking about ICT for development, but one of the panelists and I have been having a conversation about how these are today two parallel universes that need to come closer together to each other. And I think in, in organizing this particular workshop, our organizers, and I do want to introduce one of our organizers and recognize the other. This workshop was organized by WITSA, the World IT Services Alliance, and Anders Halverson, if you might, um, Anders, um, is here. We also have some participants on the panel who are affiliated with WITSA. WITSA has 84 association members in this alliance, and we have a colleague from the Afghanistan um, a member of WITSA who is here as well. The other co-organizer is GIIC, the Global <coughs> Information Infrastructure Commission. Dan O'Neill is not able to, to join us today. This is the third workshop that they have organized, organizing two previous workshops at the previous one in Lithuania and one in Sharm el Sheikh, sorry, one in Kenya. Um, the, to think about the parallel universes of ICT for D, there's a whole rich set of practitioners and issues that are going on. And in the IG for D theme that is emerging and really is being developed probably most um, deeply here at the IGF, we haven't really brought those two universes together yet. And one of the things we're going to explore this morning is what does IG for D mean? So what does I Internet Governance for Development mean? And what is happening now or what needs to happen to take IG for D more broadly into other areas? The speakers today, and I'm just going to briefly introduce each of the speakers and then ask them to make a few opening comments in a first round, and then we'll go back with a round of questions. The speakers today, come from a variety of um, practitioner levels, ranging from a senior official in, from Botswana, Botswari, who will be talking with us about the concerns and interest from his role as the chair of the, 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 he is the board chair of the Botswana Telecommunications Authority, 
and to his left is Jimson Olafui, who is um, a businessman from Nigeria who has a long history of leading in the ICT business sector and has recently founded, along with some colleagues, a new association called AFICTA. And I'm going to ask him to talk specifically about the views of the business sector in this particular area. To my right, then, is Kristen Peterson, who is the CEO of a, an, an or, a company, but a not-for-profit company, that is providing services in developing countries to advance affordable and sustainable access. And I'm, she's going to be sharing some of her experiences and thoughts with us. And to her right is Josh Hayes. Josh is with USAID, but has a long history of being a practitioner on ground, both in Africa and also in the MENA region. And next to him is Shauna Finnegan. Shauna is with APC, the Association for Progressive Communication, previously was at IISD, and she's going to be talking about two um, areas of experience that she has had in working in this area, one in relation to um, an, an experience briefly on Rio Plus 20, but also more specifically, she's going to be sharing some more current thoughts about this uh, issue that I just introduced of the two parallel universes and what the gaps are. We're going to ask you to be interactive and engaged with us in interacting with the panelists. And um, we may be joined. We have a colleague, Nizar Zaka, who is on his way here but caught in traffic. So he may be joining us and we'll insert him into the dialogue when he arrives. Let me say a couple of words about the importance of the Internet Governance Forum um, overall in terms of acting as a change agent. I think one of the things that we um, don't really fully appreciate yet is the power of the convening of the Internet Governance Forum to bring together people who otherwise would not really have an opportunity to talk to each other in depth about areas and issues that concern governance of the internet. There's a lot of pressure right now, a lot of questions at this time about the uh, possibility of changing the governance of the internet. There's a treaty conference coming up later this year hosted by the International Telecommunication Union. There's debates going on in the UN about the possibility of new structures. There's a very strong um, recognition that technology and innovation can do much more than they're doing today and can be much more broad broadly distributed than they are today. And there's a growing concern about policy issues like privacy, cybersecurity, protecting children, um, capacity building, all sorts of issues that are on the minds both of users and policy makers. But when we th so when we think about internet governance for a sustainable world and how does internet governance affect development, um, we thought we would try to look at real practice, that is, what is going on from the experience of these speakers, and then try to tease out some examples of either things we ought to do better or do more of or find a way to publicize more. So let me start off with Dr. Jimson Olafui from Aficta and ask him to uh, make his opening remarks. Jimson. Thank you very much, um, Lady Marilyn Kate. I want to appreciate you for that uh, brief uh, introduction. Uh, my name again is Jimson Olufuye. Uh, I used to be the president of the Information Technology Industry Association of Nigeria. I finished my term uh, last year, and uh, in that role, I joined the IG movement, and when I finished my term, uh, I saw indeed that Africa needs a voice with regard to ICT industry, and that was why uh, my colleagues and I in Africa, uh, colleagues in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Namibia, in Rwanda, of course Nigeria, uh, Gambia, Kenya, uh, we joined hands together to form the African ICT Alliance to further enrich the internet governance space within the African perspective. So over time we've been, uh, we started May 
May 1st as part of the sustainability uh, strategy for uh, the world we live in, which, in which uh, multi-stakeholderism uh, should prevail, we believe it should prevail. And so since uh, May 1st, we've been quite active in uh, uh, mobilizing and supporting our national IG movements. And uh, I'm proud to say uh, today that uh, many of our members looking forward to inputs from our FICTA. Uh, where recently we also made some contribution to ITU uh, concerning the uh, WCIT 12, uh, ITR coming up uh, next month. Uh, we believe uh, for us to sustain the current momentum in the world, uh, the multi-stakeholder model must be sustained. And uh, it requires every hand uh, coming together to make this happen. Uh, most importantly, we feel that um, uh, IG, if it's properly uh, administered and uh, put in perspective, it will really help in uh, Chita Po voting uh, development in Africa. When I say Chita Po voting, you know, Chita is the fastest animal, and um, you know, Po vote, the, the, the sport Po vote, Chita Po voting, so that means we really want to develop. And so Africa uh, needs to develop. This is our time, and we want to bring every stakeholder uh, together. So we look forward to expansion of our FICTA, and the next uh, year it will further enrich uh, the discussion on IG and the sustainability of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jemson. And we'll come back and ask you some questions about the key themes and issues that FICTA is focusing on. Let me turn now to my um, friend and colleague, Patsuiri uh, Opa, I, I said informally before some of you arrived that um, um, Batsuri came to the United States for a fairly long, I think a month or more, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, spent some time in an a expanded um, program there. And we had the opportunity to spend eight hours on a bus together traveling between Washington, D.C. and, um, and New York. Um, because physical transport was the only way that we could engage in the interaction with the experts on cybersecurity that we wanted to, to meet with. But um, one of the things that I had the opportunity to learn about a little bit was Botswana's leadership and commitment to ICTs and to advancing the voice of Botswana as an industry, a leader in the, the, the changing world of um, bringing access, not only affecting Africa, but also leadership more broadly. Let me turn to you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, for, for having me here. Uh, I think I would like to associate myself with what my colleagues have just said, has just said with regard to the importance of the the IGF and the multi-stakeholder uh, model to addressing the issues of um, uh, internet governance. Uh, we all are in agreement that uh, around the world countries are very much concerned with uh, internet governance and the issue of uh, digital divide. What sh uh, We have challenges, but the question is how do we address those challenges? I want to believe that as someone coming from a developing economy such as Botswana, we we don't want to address uh, the challenges that we, f we face uh, by replacing a well-working and fine model with something that is complex and uh, more costly and that is going to really take away the, the gains that we have made as, um, as the developing world. First of all, I think I must uh, make it clear that uh, Africa is not a monolith. It's a, it's a continent with more than or close to a billion people. And we have diverse development interests as Africa. So for me, really, my interest will be articulating what I believe is um, the interest of Botswana, before I can think of the interest of SADC and the interest of the rest of Africa. What does Botswana want to gain from this uh, kind of forum? I think that is, uh, for me, is the, is, the, is the starting point. And uh, I would like to indicate that uh, the Internet economy has basically uh, contributed about 2% of GDP to, to Botswana. Uh, through the uh, tourism sector, uh, e-commerce, e-ticketing, and all those, that is um, the air traffic and all that. So it has contributed significantly to, to, to GDP, to development of, uh, of the country. And uh, one, one wants to look at uh, the challenges that we face with regard to the Internet. And uh, whilst addressing those challenges, we also want to look at what opportunities and what benefits we have uh, gained 
as a country, as a region, and as a continent as a result of uh, the internet. So whatever changes that you want to propose, you also want to look at what is it that uh, we are moving away from and what are we likely to lose or gain as a result of moving away from what we, we know. And um, going back to a couple of uh, challenges, I have two of my colleagues here who are basically the, the experts. I'm chairman of the board. These are the experts. Uh, I, I think in, uh, in Botswana, one of the key issues that uh, we still have to contend with is the, the high cost of bandwidth and internet service, services. One wants to really interact with uh, colleagues here and try to establish how we could go around that. The bottom line being that we believe that the internet is quite important. This, contributing significantly to the to, uh, to economic growth and development in Botswana but we still have these challenges of higher cost of bandwidth and internet services how do you go about uh, addressing such challenges the other challenge is the issue of law IT uh, literacy of course there are numerous attempts numerous projects in Botswana that are basically being implemented to address the issue of uh, law IT literacy and all that but with law IT literacy that uh, creates a challenge with regard to uptake on um, on the on the internet so i mean for botswana for us to start before you can, you can even think of uh, how do you regulate or not regulate the internet you also you want to establish what is the uptake i mean you cannot re regulate something that is non-existent you want to know whether as it is in Botswana, we have people using the internet. If you don't have a large number of people using the what are the hindrances? What is uh, uh, the problem? And uh, once you have addressed that, then you can maybe think of how can we uh, make uh, whatever gains that you can make from the internet. And uh, we also have uh, the issue of high prices for computers and end-user devices. And these are basically some of the, the challenges that we have to deal with to ensure that our people have access to the internet service. The key thing for us, the internet is very key to our development. We are trying to diversify our economy away from diamonds. I mean, for those who do not know, Botswana is uh, the largest producer of diamonds in the world by value. Uh, well, it's a population of 2 million people, the largest producer of diamonds by value. We are trying to, with the downturn in global economy in 2008, we are trying to move away from diamonds in tourism. And for us to move into tourism and other sectors, we need the internet. Thank you very much, Merlin. Thank you, Batsuri, and I, I have a couple of uh, questions in mind for you to ask you to elaborate further on this when we come back. I see that Nizar Zaka has been able to join us. I'll go to Kristen first and let her speak, and Nizar, and then come back to you, if that's okay. Um, let me turn to Kristen Peterson. I'm going to ask her actually to open by telling you just a little bit about the business model of Invenio and go on with your, some of your examples. Thank you much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, mm -hmm. let me tell you a little bit about Invenio. Um, Invenio, uh, my organization, is a nonprofit social enterprise. Mm -hmm. Our mission, we're based in San Francisco, but we work all over the developing world. Our mission is to get the tools of technology. When I say the tools of technology, I mean better access to sustainable computing and broadband services out to people and organizations that need it most in often in very rural and underserved areas across the developing world. And we do so by looking at uh, users and what their needs are, um, users who can help make access to ICTs and internet affordable, relevant, and available to communities to transform lives through better access to education, healthcare, economic opportunity, and faster relief. We use models, um, economic models and ecosystems to deliver better access. And increasingly, we've been focused on not just access to sustainable computing, but more importantly, access to sustainable, financially affordable broadband services, because we see that that is really the key to, to driving community and economic development across underserved regions in the developing world. Some, of, some examples of our recent projects include um, uh, working with a local service provider in Kenya to, to extend uh, high quality broadband access into relief camps to support improvement of their operations and communications to deliver, um, to deliver uh, services in Dadaab. Uh, building up an ecosystem and a shared broadband network to deliver high quality, one megabit or more, broadband access across rural Haiti 
reaching about 20 percent of the, the rural Haitian population. And a third area is, uh, is um, many years ago, working with um, Caritas to develop broadband access in northern Uganda uh, post, um, post uh, uh, regional conflict so they could use internet access to drive better development, faster development, increasing uh, incorporation of the displaced community back into um, the back into the broader world. That that internet access project still stands today. As you can imagine, based on the the topic of this conference overall and topic of today's uh, meeting, I was thrilled to become a participant. I'd like to um, identify a few key issues where we think multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder, um, uh, uh, involvement is really critical for expanding broadband access to underserved areas around the world uh, in projects that it, from the perspective of, of an implementer and where we see key issues. First is affordability. In many of these the places where we work, high quality, and we deem high quality, we, we define high quality as one megabit symmetrical. Many of, many of you who live in the developed world get access to 100 megabits for maybe $100 a month or more. Just to give you some sense of the affordability in places where we work, in places where many, many of you may work as well. Um, in Haiti, the cost of one megabit symmetrical right now is approximately $800 a month in rural areas. That's for one megabit. And uh, the cost in rural Kenya on a number of projects that we're working on right now. One of the leading countries at proliferating ICT and better access to broadband is about $200 to $250 a month. In Dadaab, where we worked, the service providers are offering two megabit symmetrical for 400. Multi-stakeholder approach to driving down access costs is really critical. Oh, and I'll add one more. In South Sudan, one of our partner service providers that we're working with is offering one megabit for $2,000 a month, maybe $2,800. It depends on the negotiation power of the buyer. Uh, the second area which is really critical for multi-stakeholder participation is increasing overall access. Uh, one of the recent Millennium Goal reports stated that the world is increasingly connected through mobile high-speed communications, yet two-thirds of the world's population have yet to gain access to the Internet. This is part of a recent publication of UN Millennium Goals. In fact, we, um, we estimate in the countries that we work in, we've worked in over 25 countries in the developing world, 90% of the population has no access to internet infrastructure, which hinders everything that we take for granted today. Better access to education, uh, accessing a doctor or a diagnosis by using the internet to take a picture and send it to a place, send it to a, a hospital that could diagnose a key issue. This kind of infrastructure, um, to quote an old saying, is, um, is if access to the, the internet is, is like access to the information superhighway, many of the places we work don't even have a dirt road on route to that information superhighway. And their, their ability to participate, um, both get access to services and participate in the world, is hindered greatly. The third uh, and one of the uh, one of the supporting elements to the two that I just mentioned um, is increasing voices of users in the dialogue of need for internet and the dialogue of how to get better access to the internet. Um, it's important that that many different types of stakeholders have a voice in how internet can be delivered into more underserved arenas. Um, for example, in areas where we work, uh, using um, open access models to provide lower cost to internet services for resale, using shared models, shared access models um, for, uh, and vehicles to provide lower cost overall for internet service providers to deliver access, as well as using new models like um, wireless internet service providers, new and nascent smaller service providers and allowing a healthy competitive environment is really critical as well. And finally, um, under increasing voices, it's also important for a well-governed internet. Uh, well-governed um, internet is critical for driving transparency, including, including voices um, of everyone in the community to understand what's happening in their country and the world and to help drive those decisions. Um, finally, I'd just like to use a quote with one of our recent 
um, and new users of some of the, the capacities that we're building. We just finished um, building out um, uh, internet access to schools in rural Haiti uh, and computing centers and, and our local partners um, are providing digital literacy programs there. And to quote um, Rosaline Francois, who can say it better than I can, I always dreamed to learn the computer but never had the opportunity and also the internet. I want to learn and teach members in my family. That will be good for me, for my organization, which is a rural farmers, health, uh, rural farmers alliance, I believe, and my community. Thank you. Kristen, thank you. I, um, I'm going to just uh, pose a question for you to start thinking about um, when I come back. Um, I think you've laid out a slightly different um, um, structure for me to think about. Normally, we think about uh, the policy maker, the policy practitioner, policy wonk, the uh, service provider, and maybe the um, consumer. But I think you're introducing um, some other um, characteristics or aspects of uh, engagement, the, the different, so you, you might not be interested as a user in affecting policy, but you might be really interested in affecting the implementation of that policy. And that's kind of a key point that I want to come back to and maybe uh, think about with you and some of the other folks. Uh, it's my opportunity now to introduce my dear friend Nizar Zaka. Um, Nizar has a, a, a very um, uh, interesting uh, focus in the work that he's doing right now. And I'm going to ask him to say a few words about Ishma and, and then go on with talking about um, uh, the particular topic areas that he wants to uh, introduce. And I hope in your comments you'll also uh, say a few words about WAVE. Thank you, Megan, and, and sorry for arriving late. It was because of the bus, the IGF bus arrived late. So uh, I represent an organization that it's an alliance of different ICT associations from the Arab world. It's called IJMA, the ICT, uh, the ICT organization, the Arab ICT organization. It's based in Beirut. And one of our objectives, we represent the Arab ICT private sector and we work hard in order to make sure that the voice of the private sector in the Arab world is well heard and listened to. And the process of multi-stakeholder in this part of the world is, is, is well balanced between all three parties, the civil society, the private sector and the government. Especially today, we are, I believe our region, our region is at high risk of, uh, because of all what happened with the Arab Spring, that governments are finding more and more ways to limit or to, uh, to uh, single-handed uh, govern the Internet in this part of the world. And what we are working, what we would like, also to raise as a concern that we face regularly is uh, the representation of the, st of the stakeholders. And this is a part that in our part of the world, it's a very critical and a very confused uh, terminologies. Who represents the private sector? Who represents the civil society? Is a government employee who, who, who belong to a civil society organization become representative? of the civil society of that country in a multi-stakeholder approach or it's, or it's a civil society organization that has a constituency that is relevant to the issues at stake that represent the stakeholder. And this is happening, I believe, here at the, at the IGF, at the Arab IGF, as a, almost on every multi-stakeholder platform that we visit. We see in the past we used to have a minister who is friend with, uh, with, a, with a company owner, he bring him to a meeting and we were calling this a private public partnership. Okay, this is how it used to happen and today we are facing this with the multi-stakeholder approach. Especially because in our part of the world we don't have this large 
large-sized companies and large-sized civil society organizations. So this is why it's very critical, and we, are very, we have a very big concern to raise. And I, I, am really, I really want to thank Marilyn for giving me the opportunity to come to this platform and to raise our concern. We had, for example, I want to give a small example. We, at one of the stakeholder groups for the Arab region, the, my, uh, Microsoft were representing the Arab private sector, which all our respect and love to Microsoft cannot represent the Arab private sector. Okay. It can represent almost everything else, but not the Arab private sector. <laughs> And therefore, we would like, uh, we, we, th we think the solutions, are, we have different solutions. This is one of the concerns we have. But on the other hand, also, we believe that the users have, uh, the users, I want to emphasize that the role of users in, uh, as well is so important. And the better service and for access that we don't have any watchdog to, to assess the service we're getting. We have access, we don't have quality of service. And there is no way, there is no accountability by anyone. And this is one of, of the way we would like that the civil society, we work very hard with the civil society to play a significant role, to be, to, to be a watchdog on the level of service in many of these activities. As well as the broadband stakeholder groups that we were able to develop as a regional, the Arab broadband stakeholder group, which, which is evaluating, which is regularly meeting and bringing different sectors from each country. We see the sectors, the business sectors that are the most efficient and, the, uh, and they, are, they have the most say within the economy and we bring them on the table and we try, and we try to bring everybody together. We know as, I, as representative of the ICT private sector, we do not represent the private sector because ICT today, it's, it's, it's a vector that is crossing multiple sectors, so we do not represent, but we are one of the representatives on, on the table. And this is what we want to make clear when we sit on any stakeholder. As for access, and, and we believe that, as an organization, we believe that a lot can be, can be done by regulation and by, uh, by uh, at this stage uh, uh, the law we, we had a very good experience about access or about the licensing process to uh, to oblige when you provide a license and the frequency to link the frequency by deployment of access by the private sector this will reduce the revenue in the short term for government, it's exactly the same problem we faced when it was about, connect, about mo mobile technologies and uh, that it's not a cash cow for government. And they, need, they need to understand this. Licensing, spectrum re 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 farming, it's not, uh, it's not the way, it's not, uh, it's not a money genera generating a licensing process for the government. And the government need to make the regulation where private sector can do it better and faster in our part of the world, but we need to, to, give, to give them incentive to start in rural area before going into, to, into the cities to make sure ev our part of the world is all connected. Finally, we believe that freedom online is key to the internet governance and without freedom online. Low internet Slow internet, it's a form of censorship for our internet. And we, would and we work very hard to make sure that having slow internet, it's not acceptable, it's censorship by governments. And, and we would like governments to be officially accountable to slow internet and to pay the price if they stop the internet one day or they block the internet another day. And this is what we try to do and I hope I, I was too long, I'm sorry. You weren't too long because I'm going to ask you briefly to describe WAVE before I go on to Josh, the new uh, women's organization. Also, current, also currently our organization is working on creating the Women Alliance in the MENA and Central Asia for I, uh, Women ICT Alliance that bringing the women into the picture to have more role and more activity and more access and, and more entrepreneurship 
they, we would like a woman to get more role into high executive positions. And our organization is working with multi parties, U.S. government and other parties and other civil society organization in order to make sure that access uh, for women and ICT for women is available and they are getting more and more higher uh, executive position because this is the only way we get uh, the private sector will benefit the market will go the private sector w will benefit more by having a, uh, this uh, half the half the society also connected uh, uh, to the internet and having more work thank you and um, later when we come back on a question I'm um, I'm gonna ask Nizar the same question I was posing to Kristen about the different kinds of voices and voices at different places and stages. Um, it's my pleasure to turn to Josh. And Josh has a very interesting background that I've barely had an opportunity to touch on learning about. Um, but um, let me turn to you, Josh. Thank you very much, Merlin. So I'm Joshua Haynes. That's weird. <laughs> so I'm Joshua Haynes, and I um, am a development technologist at USAID. I don't know what development technologist means either, but it looks good on a business card. To answer your question bluntly, Maryland, about internet governance for sustainable world, mainstreaming, and I'll come back to that in a second. At USAID, we think, um, well, and I think as well, internet governance equals access. And echoing a number of the comments that were made by my fellow panelists, we believe that access is on a continuum from providing access, ensuring access, promoting access, and making sure that there's access during and after access. So what does that mean and what are we doing as the U.S. government and the development arm of the U.S. government to make sure that this happens? In terms of providing access, yes, developing countries need more assistance to help build out broadband and work with their universal service and access funds to transition them to 21st century organizations from a voice based to a broadband based and also to ensure that these broadband national broadband plans are implementable we have a program where we're working with a number of countries like Nigeria Ghana Indonesia Colombia to, to provide technical assistance to countries to understand what to do with these universal access funds and ensure that it's not a subsidy model where the telecom is paying a very small percentage of revenues into a fund that can then eventually be used for broadband extension, but to change it into a seed investment because it is access in and of itself is a multi-stakeholder approach whereby the government needs to work and invest in in conjunction with service providers, with the private sector and civil society to ensure that there is affordable broadband and it's sustainable. In terms of ensuring access, after someone has access, that doesn't mean that the game is over. It's important that we give the legal enabling environment so that people have the rights, the frameworks, the, the revenue models, the structures to, to, to ensure that the system works and that the access and the broadband is a catalyst for both economic and social development. In terms of promoting access, and this is maybe one of my, my, my main points, the IGF and internet governance um, deals with or is en encompassed by primarily tech-focused organizations, tech-focused government entities, the Ministry for ICT, the Ministry for Telecommunications, civil society, which are associations of ICT associations from around the world, so that's great, as well as uh, the private sector, which are tech-focused private sector. Well, in order to have a sustainable internet governance, we need to get out of this bubble and take it to the next level. What does that mean? That means civil society, for example, in every country, there should not only be associations of ICT groups, advocacy groups, and as Nisar said, watchdog groups, but also human rights groups, environment groups, health groups, any other civil society organization should understand how the internet affects them and how the governance of the internet eventually affects their reality. The same thing with private sector and ministries. We need to focus on not only the ICT ministry, but also in the telecom ministry, the finance ministry, the health ministry, the ministry for women's affairs, etc. 
because by taking a, a 360 degree view of the situation and mainstreaming the, this idea of internet governance and inculcating it, um, uh, injecting it into everything we do, we're able to make sure that it's sustainable. And then lastly, uh, is making sure not only that um, people can remain safe and resilient online, so internet freedom and the freedom uh, of speech online, um, so that they can express human rights uh, in terms of freedom of expression, association, and, and assembly. It's crucial, yes. But after they're online, ensuring that there's also the ability to remain safe and resilient offline, irrespective of what has happened online. So if someone is, is able, uh, if... In, has actions online that there there's no threat offline in the offline environment as well to which USAID does have programs to ensure that people have the tools the technology um, and the the knowledge to to stay resilient online and offline so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there thank you thanks Josh and I'm gonna go to um, Shauna Finnegan Shauna um, worked initially um, at um, ISD and was part of a very interesting uh, study that took place there, but she is now at the Association for Progressive Communication and is working in um, an area related to um, human rights. So she's going to focus on a couple of areas in her comments with us, and then we'll come back with a round of questions, Shana. Thanks very much. Oh. Don't want to hear myself speak. Uh, thanks very much, Marilyn, and it's been really great to be on this panel. Uh, this is actually my first IGF, and I'm quite impressed by all of the panels that I've been uh, both attending, and this will actually be my first panel that I'm on. And I, I love the discussion about multi-stakeholderism, because that's, that's really what APC is all about. Um, so I feel that I should probably uh, mention, first of all, as a way of background, I come from an environmental sustainability background first. I'm actually quite new to um, ICTs. And so um, for me, it's interesting because um, when I f originally started working on environmental policy issues, um, ICTs are, are often treated in that area as, as um, outside, as something that's just used. To, yeah, great, we'll use ICTs and they'll, they'll help us get our goals. But it's, it's quite vague in a lot of ways. And so actually when I started working on ICT issues I worked um, mostly at a, a practical level I started working uh, with APC on their greening IT project um, and so that's um, which is quite interesting so I was working uh, mostly on climate change adaptation mitigation but at a policy issue or policy level sorry and um, working with APC they look at how can something like an information portal or uh, mobile phones be used to help individual communities adapt to climate change? How do they find information on rainwater harvesting? How do they connect with other communities and predict, you know, rainfalls? How can we, you know, resilience is, is a big thing that I think ICTs can, can really help with in terms of environmental sustainability. And so it was quite interesting uh, from there working with APC on the Greening IT project. I then um, just recently attended the Rio Plus 20 conference as sort of a, a joint effort between IISD and APC looking at how ICTs were discussed within Rio Plus 20 at a, at a policy level. And what we found is that the same discussion is happening as, yes, ICTs are great, you know, they'll help us in this sort of vague way to access information. Or uh, one example that I thought was quite interesting at an ITU session that I attended was discussing uh, mapping technology and how using this mapping technology they could find out deforestation in the Brazilian rainforests and, and combat it. But of course, no one mentioned, well, who is it that's 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 you know cutting down these trees is it local communities who need these trees and who have actually been uh, one of the themes often of environmental governance is that uh, you know you you put up these walls and you decide we're going to protect this nature and it's often at the detriment of the communities who for years have been using that and and I think ICTs are very much in danger of contributing to this idea that if you just you know you put up a wall and you say we're going to map it and find out who's, you know, who's to using this, and then you really are, you're fur further marginalizing communities that, you know, 
are, are at the most risk. I mean, uh, right now, climate change adaptation is, is often, you know, the best that they have. And I think what's interesting actually is, um, so at the Rio Plus 20, there was sort of the official conference, the negotiations, and then there was the sort of more official civil society side events. And then there was the People Summit. And the People Summit was very much local civil society, and they didn't frame it in terms of the green economy and, or any of the kind of framing that Rio Plus 20 uses. It was very much environmental justice and really great discussions about, for example, research suggesting that women, for example, are, are often uh, best placed in terms of nature conservation, uh, community-based uh, conservation. But that discussion not only did it not feed into policy, but it, it had nothing to do with ICTs. And I remember discussing with a woman, she was discussing rainwater harvesting and, and how women were using these in communities she'd worked in. And I asked about, do you think that ICTs or information portals could be used? And she said, we don't have access to the internet. This isn't, we need to be dealing with the actual real life concerns and ICTs are too far ahead for us. And so I think that's why it's a great point that a lot of the panelists have made here today that access is, is hugely important because if you don't have access, then we're not, we're not part of that domain. And I think um, what's really interesting is that my experience has been actually that the ICT for D community um, that I, what I've gotten to know over the past few years is in many ways more in touch with what's going on on the ground than is the, the governance. And I think uh, both with my experience um, working on internet policy issues and internet governance as well as environmental policy and environmental governance is there is this split between the practice and the policy. And I think that not only do we have a lot to learn we as internet governance uh, folks to learn from the sustainable development community, but I think we have a lot to learn at the policy level from ICT practitioners. And I think that, I mean, of course, ICT for D, they, you know, it can be more multi-stakeholder, you know, it can be more inclusive, but I think in many ways it's getting there faster than internet policy is. And I think that definitely needs to be a focus in the future. Um, and one thing I'd like to mention, where I work now uh, with APC is on their internet rights, as Marilyn mentioned. And what we've done is we've really worked to get human rights defenders, women, mostly women human rights defenders, who are working on the ground, and we're asking them, so what are your issues with technology? And there was a great session yesterday going on where women were discussing harassment on Facebook and, and these women human rights defenders who are, are you know, basically having to withdraw from from political life as a result of the way that um, they're sort of being being slandered being being you know having these these you know hate speech and 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 mistreatment online and I think I think that's really important is to get the people who are affected by technology both positively and negatively in the room to tell us what we need to do because we can't tell them what's best for them they need to tell us what we need to give to them and I think I think that's a really important starting point, and I'll, I'll leave it there. I want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. I am going to pose a couple of questions to the panelists, but can I, first of all, see if anyone in the audience or a remote participant wants to ask a question? Do we have any? We have two questions, I think. Omar, right? No? Okay. Omar, I did want to turn to you. May I? And I'm not sure if we have a microphone, but if we don't, hold on just a minute. We should have. Yes, we have a microphone in the back of the room. Um, uh, thank you very much. I really very much enjoyed uh, uh, this session. Uh, I have a question to Nizar. Uh, it's it's fine now. Okay. Um, uh, I have a question. Uh, you've mentioned uh, watchdog women in ICT and the uh, Central and MENA region in Central Asia, uh, and there were a few other issues. But if I combine them, they, they would be like three, four questions. <laughs> but I'd like to uh, ask 
the first question about the watchdog because this is my country's uh, Afghanistan's uh, challenge as well and uh, before putting the question uh, I'd like to introduce myself Omar Mansour Ansari I'm presiding over the National ICT Alliance of Afghanistan I'm a co-founder and board member of the Open Source Alliance of Central Asia and uh, recently founded the Tech Women uh, Afghanistan Network the leadership of women in technology. So we are working on developing that. And the next step would be um, uh, a formation of Tech Women Central Asia. Uh, that's where we can collaborate. I'm, I'm really glad that you've, you've already started thinking and more working on that. Uh, my question is about the watchdog. Uh, uh, it's, it's my country's problem uh, that uh, in the government, there are people who are affiliated to certain uh, companies and firms. You go to the Ministry of Communications, you would see a director, there's director, and another director is this director's cousin, and then his cousin is also in the same organization, and they're kind of networked, uh, 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 these uh, 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 corrupt uh, uh, individuals in uh, uh, it's it's becoming a real challenge for Afghanistan. With the cost, we still have uh, one MB uh, is uh, uh, is around one thousand US dollars. Uh, shared is four hundred uh, US dollars. But dedicated service to Afghan Telecom. I'm not talking about that. This is state-owned. Uh, 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 service for telecom uh, provider. Uh, uh, owner of the optical fiber that's providing one thousand dollars per uh, uh, one uh, MB per, uh, per, uh, for for one thousand US dollars, uh, but the price in uh, never came down and the quality never went up. Uh, how are the watchdogs, especially in the ICT sector, uh, working, and how we can uh, work together to address challenges of the developing countries like Afghanistan? And Nizar, before you answer, I suspect that might be a question that um, Jimson might want to be thinking about responding to as well. Um, so Nizar, please. Thank, thank you, Omar. Uh, first, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I, we worked together in Afghanistan a few years ago, and I was I am glad that I am I was part when you when you established the, the alliance ICT alliance in Afghanistan. And I am I'm happy that uh, it's going fast and you're doing a great job in it. Uh, and another thing that you did, the Tech Woman Initiative for Afghanistan, this is perfect. This is a great, you know how much it's, uh, it's important for us in all our work. And hopefully you, you go next time. The tech, the tech woman has, has to be part of the wave where tech women from all over the Middle East and North Africa and Central Asia, few of the Central Asian countries are coming together. We would, we would love to have you. As for the watchdog, the, the watchdog is uh, what we have been facing regularly is that we have never had a successful watchdog in our part of the world. We have never been able to, uh, to measure and uh, to uh, the fame and shame approach for I, for ISPs, who that they are not providing the service levels they are, they are claiming to provide. We have never received any support, nor internationally, nor locally, to uh, to uh, protect the consumer. Uh, and the consumer have have never received in our part of the world the proper awareness about his rights when it comes to to service level. So this is all together. This is what's creating a problem. So what we try to do, the watchdog, first need to to uh, to create awareness and educate the civil societies and the community in general about the rights of uh, of quality they're, uh, they're getting and to be equipped properly. To, to be able to measure the service level and have regular reporting. And this is, and this is one of the issues that regulation also need to be a part of it. We need to have, like uh, uh, Joshua just uh, suggested something about what's happening 
in uh, in Nigeria about having probably a certain amount that is taken from ISPs to to fund this uh, to make seeds money for develop for developing the ISP sector or the or the access. Well, also in Egypt for many years they have an organization called ITIDA. And it either it's a private-public partnership that is main objective. They, get, they take part of the taxes paid by the GSM operators. And this fund is for the development of the ICT sector and the, and the access. And all this together can be something very interesting to follow. And it's a very good example. And uh, so, uh, Joshua, go ahead. Yeah, just real, real quick. So these are the universal service and access funds. And a number of countries have them. Uh, a number of countries, are, unfortunately, because of the, the regulatory environment and maybe old laws that are on the book, have books have difficulties taking the money and actually transmitting the money into uh, turning it around into extending broadband or creating b broadband national plans and so that's that's one of the, one of the the ways that USAID is is working with a number of countries on this specifically but let me ask a question so yes uh, on access but the aspect of um, ensuring that there is an independent space and place where people can make complaints or absolutely uh, like it have an, a special ombudsman mm -hmm. that's protected and we know if if you look uh, in a parallel sector the media sector yeah. Yeah. it's very in some countries it's very very difficult to have that objectivity and the ombudsmanship um, a suggestion to explore instead of creating a new watchdog for I, I, for the IT and, and ISPs, et cetera, internet governance is can we piggyback upon other watchdog groups? You know, I'm, I'm just going to test the word watchdog for just a minute because I like the word ombudsman uh, a lot more than I like watchdog. I just want to understand this. Watchdog to me... Um, and so I should confess that I did start my professional life in social work. Um, and, and I worked in state government for many years before I became a technologist and worked in the sector. But watchdog to me might be finding something out and reporting it. While an ombudsman to me is find it out, report it, and help fix it. <laughs> and I guess I'm kind of interested in what I'm hearing about the finding it out is really important. Having anonymity and protection in the reporting is really important. Important, but you got to also fix it, or all you're doing is just reporting, right? Uh, am I grasping this? Yeah. And I think that there's there's a becoming an increasing um, understanding that access to the internet should be like access to any other human right. Uh, in fact, the UN just uh, declared access to the internet a human right about six months or a year ago. But I think that we're still, I think there's still a, an under, there's still an underestimation of the importance of ICTs across uh, many constituencies and the realization that, that really, that, that protecting that access and driving further access is, is critical to, to community development, economic development. So any way that we can push that and drive that kind of behavior on top of existing organizations I would be, I think could be a very important element of where uh, internet governance goes. So I'm gonna take Joshua and then we have a remote comment and then I'm gonna come back up here to, um, to the two of you and then we'll come back to it. Just one point of, of phraseology, we have to be careful about saying we are going to do this, we're going to create civil society, we're going to push this, we're going to assist civil society, private sector, in country to have the tools, techniques to do everything that they need to do on their own. Uh, it's a very important point that I, I think we overlook, especially in the donor community, too much. Just a, a, a note. And then I'll come to you and then we'll come back up here. O'Neill from the Washing Film. Um, his question is such like, uh, can I ask Josh and Kristen to comment on the ability of the US government and the Universal Fund to work with organizations such as New Rail to push forward with economic development, increased access and sustainable development? Thank you. I'm not, oh, hold on just a minute. I think we need to be sure we understand the name of the organization.
tour. Uh, quickly... Yes. So the Universal Service and Access Fund from the USAID, the U.S. government, is uh, part of a, uh, an initiative called the Global Broadband and Innovation Initiative. And what that does is works uh, to provide, as I mentioned before, the, the, the technical expertise to work with governments in reforming these funds that we've, we've talked about um, and to bringing them into the 21st century, uh, working on implementable broadband plans. A number of countries have broad national broadband plans, but unfortunately it's uh, difficult to implement them. Um, and that's uh, a main component of, of what this project does. Uh, we're working in a number of countries now, and we, we, we very much look forward to providing assistance uh, uh, to a number of other countries as well. Hi, um, this is Kristen Peterson, and um, what we can say is that for both USAID and a number of other um, funding organizations, whether they be bilaterals, multilaterals, or foundations, one of the most important things that they can, can look at supporting um, beyond policy is looking at how they can support models, development of models that show examples of how new ecosystems can be developed for delivering broadband access. Let me give you a couple of examples. If you look at current government, uh, if you look at access models today, many of the issues about um, uh, uh, for-profit organizations not reaching further than they do to the periphery of, of, of uh, or even to, to um, uh, very close areas to the urban centers is really a failure of financial, uh, it's a financial model failure. They're looking at models using older technologies and, 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 uh, um, and old types of distribution models to get access out. If you look at some of the more radical technologies that can deliver, or more new technologies that are not radical technologies but can deliver radically lower cost, or if you look at building capacity of local ITP on IT, ICT entrepreneurs in rural areas to become participants in delivering um, access, or bring all those together, uh, or and if you can look at creating facilities, broadband networks that can be shared um, by various participants, by various ISPs, some of these models, if they can be put into um, in into demonstration projects and prove how different approaches using Wi-Fi access rather than WiMAX or some of the older school technologies to deliver high quality broadband to less dense environments. If, if those can be demonstrated and take it beyond the policy, um, we as, uh, we as, um, uh, as a community who want to get better access out to um, less dense environments can show how delivering broadband can be replicated and can share that amongst various um, governments and regions to be replicated and, 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 um, and, and by, by them and by the local service providers and ultimately by, be adopted by, local, um, by the local service providers who can ultimately scale up delivering rural broadband in a more cost-effective way. And so I would strongly suggest that, that, uh, that development agencies look at how models, newer models, can be approached and demonstrated that can be shared and replicated. I'm going to turn to you, Abel, and next. And, um, but first of all, I want to just say that at the um, United Nations UNCTAD Commission on Science and Technology for Development meeting in May, this past May, the, there was a, a very effective, extensive three-hour panel presentation highlighting um, the, some of the work that is going on to partner universal service funds and innovative technologies in bringing access in, to, in very affordable, sustainable access to small communities of no more than 300 to 350 users. And I know that there's also an initiative that Microsoft is um, and Intel are working on called White Spaces that's looking at new technologies, um, microcell technologies. So maybe one of the things that I'm taking away from this in terms of sustainability is the this very strong linkage on affordability of and, and new models. I want to go to Abel, and then I'm going to come back here for a couple of other questions. And the microphone is right here. Um, sorry.
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Abel. Uh, I'm from uh, Botswana, uh, from uh, the private sector. Uh, it's very interesting how many uh, people here we, got, we, uh, we have who actually support uh, access uh, from developing countries. Uh, but one thing that actually has struck my mind is the issue of actually how do they uh, work or select the countries that they work with. Because I've had the African Alliance on ICT. They've actually talked about my neighbor, which is Namibia. So the question is how do they jump and hop around and select who to get into alliance with? Of course, they would say it might be up to us to go into access and actually research for ourselves. But then if you're talking about uh, access, uh, internet governance for development, sometimes you might need to strike uh, a little bit of some balance and try to also do a further research and try to see whether all other countries are benefiting from what they are doing. Because I, I do believe that some countries do get sidelined. But on a different note, uh, from how the presentations were done, I don't know, due to time, uh, some people were giving uh, background or synopsis on what they were going to discuss. But it seems as if time is going, and I haven't had much of exactly uh, the meat into what they are th that they're going to be presenting uh, today. So I'm hopeful that uh, probably they're going to go in even further in into the, what the, they're supposed to deliver. Because I thought they were just giving us a, a brief uh, before they could go in or delve into the issues. Thank you. Abel, let me respond to that um, before I come back up here and ask for some more questions. The, um, the workshops are very interactive, and we are always charged with trying to interact with the audience and allow the audience to ask questions of the, um, of the, practitioner, of the practitioners who are here. So I do want to come back up here, and um, I had uh, told um, Jimson earlier, and then I'm going to come to you, please, yeah. Batsuri, um, that I wanted to come back to him and ask him to talk more about the uh, challenges that he sees that are, um, you know, I think we all agree that access is um, absolutely fundamental, but access is not just broadband. Access is much more than that. It's affordable devices. It's um, having the skills and capability of being able to use the device, whether that is uh, being literate or, or also being digitally literate, and then having access to useful information. There are lots of barriers to that and um, lots of challenges in being able to um, address how we reach further um, users and involve further users. And I know, Jimson, you've been working in this area for quite some time. Thank you very much, uh, our dear moderator. Uh, l let me first uh, uh, respond to uh, Brother Abel. But I bet actually in Africa there is nothing like uh, sidelining at all. Well, we started off uh, May 1st and uh, we've been reaching out. And so we are highly welcome. Botswana is highly welcome. Botswana private sector is highly welcome. All African countries, uh, ICT uh, industry organization, institution, the private sector, and companies, they are welcome to join in. Uh, when we come together in the spirit of multi-stakeholderism, our voices can be stronger and we can achieve uh, quickly what we want to achieve for the uh, development of our people. Uh, I haven't said that. Our website is www.afikta.org. Uh, Afikta.org. www.afikta.org. So you're welcome right away. Now, um, getting to the meat of uh, my uh, own point of view, uh, I would first take a kind of reference from uh, what Joshua mentioned earlier, talking about, uh, you know, diversifying reach. That means uh, civil society in form of advocacy, not only focusing on ICT for uh, ICT, but of course going to other areas, maybe environment, uh, maybe uh, governance, education, and what have you. But I must draw out that uh, from my little experience, uh, the challenges are enormous, especially with funding, uh, to be able to get the capacity, the right personnel to be able to focus on those uh, diverse areas. And I think that is maybe one of those uh, meeting points. Uh, USAID and AFICTA can uh, move on uh, together. Uh, and uh, I want to recognize what he has said concerning uh, the USPF funding, that Universal Service Provision Fund. Yes, it's actually very active in Nigeria and it has helped a great deal. 
uh, as an opening boxman, the, the, the regulator in Nigeria, actually, to be frank and sincere, have really done pretty well. Uh, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, our penetration was just 0.5% uh, when it comes to teledensity. Internet, it was 0.001%, percent but now things have changed dramatically. Uh, dramatically. Uh, we have uh, more than 105 million uh, telephone subscribers, uh, which is our, tel our population is about 170 million people. And uh, internet usage is about 30%, 30%, and it's growing fast. Uh, and the credit really is uh, to the regulator. The regulator created a forum called the Users' Parliament. And uh, every time they come together, and they, they were quite open and give the level playing, playing ground. You will see people criticizing the regulator. The regulator take note, criticizing the service provider quality, low quality uh, pro uh, service. They take note and they warn them, warn them. After a series of um, more, um, kind of warning period, the regulator started fining the telecom operators. In fact, recently they pay about one fifty million dollars. They cry, no, we can't do it. They find them and they're going to find them and things are improving. So the regulator has a great role to play. And this also takes me to uh, the role the moderator and I had the privilege of playing in the United Nations uh, CSTD uh, Working Group on IGF Improvement. The CSTD is uh, the Commission for Science and Technology for Development. And uh, we had a lot of outcomes. And uh, representing the business community, there were five of us representing the, the private sector. And uh, we, we were able to really uh, push for more uh, democratization of even organization involved in IG, Internet Governor, more democratization. For example, you say that you are in business. Uh, Nisa talk about Microsoft re re representing MENA. But, well, we know Microsoft is a global entity, but how about the local player? They need to be involved. Everybody needs to be involved. And, uh, and that is why we uh, feel that uh, the pathway of enhanced cooperation, enhanced cooperation is the way to go instead of enhanced treaty. Okay? Enhanced cooperation is far better than enhanced treaty, wherein uh, all the global players in IG, like uh, ICANN, uh, Africa recently was admitted into the business constituency of ICANN, which is uh, graciously you know, shared by the, even our, our moderator leading very well so that the voice of business can be heard in that multi-stakeholder entity. So ICANN is quite active. So ICANN needs to improve more, and they're improving. They need to do more. And also uh, ITU, uh, the Internet Engineering Tax Force, ISOC, WIPO, UNESCO, UNESCO uh, the uh, W3C, the NRO, the Council of Europe, and OECD. So there is need for us to have a measuring scale. There is need to be measured. If you cannot measure it, you, you cannot manage it. You should be able to measure how far we are going in this process of uh, multi-stakeholderism, measuring uh, the progress made by entities. Like AFICTA, we want to be measured. We want to see how far we're able to uh, progress, uh, reaching out, even to women. If I got inspiration from uh, what uh, my Afghanistan brother shared and Nisa about women, so maybe we're going to start a women wing, <laughs> you know, to reach out to you know, so the women. Because we have some women in our midst and they're quite uh, passive. So I think that is uh, an opener, you know, for me. And then, so there is need, you know, for uh, this reform in tandem with the Tunis agenda. We need to know that. The Tunisia agenda that set up IGF has said it clearly that everybody must be involved. And so we need to uh, improve on that and reform the internal governance uh, structure. And uh, it, it, then participation from developing countries is very crucial. Uh, that is where uh, funding matters too because it costs a lot to be able to fly down here. And uh, so if you have priority for experts, if you have priority for the, those that are playing active roles, like uh, the, the women the leadership and, of course, uh, industry leadership, to encourage them. And the United Nations is uh, doing their best. Uh, the, uh, the business community constituency in ICANN is uh, working out at this. So many of those organizations, like USAID, of course, to need to identify more opportunity to build capacity and capability among developing nations. If you are going to sustain 
sustain the world. We are talking about sustaining the world. We need to have everybody carried along. And uh, where it is killed and uh, to, to disadvantage is uh, developing nation, Africa in particular. And so we need to focus on this and investment in training and retraining towards building critical mass of subject matter experts is desirable. And also, as I mentioned earlier, funding to boost the participation from underrepresented is also uh, uh, very key. So uh, I think for now, this is uh, what uh, I will just uh, share. And uh, finally, to round off that, um, the, the oversight of the USPF funding is very important. At a point, they got it wrong. You know, but what uh, USAID is talking about helping through, I think it's key because the regulator in Nigeria now is talking more about broadband. There's a policy for a while they were looking, and I, all of a sudden there's activity. So maybe that's the result of what uh, uh, the intervention of uh, USAID. And I think it needs to be sustained, you know, in African countries. So let me take this back to you, Butswari, because Jimson brought us back to thinking about um, access and sustainability, and we've touched on a number of things, but I want to come back to you because you are, you had a very interesting role, it seems to me. Botswana is a, in a, a particularly unique position, I think, to lead in some areas that um, we may not have heard from you as a country so much in the past, but um, you're also, I think, showing some, um, you have some experience both in the Universal Service Fund, but also in interacting with users. Mm -hmm. um, so share some comments, if you will, about the things you've heard so far. Thank you, Marilyn. Is it on? Uh, thank you, Marilyn. I think uh, with regard to the issue of uh, interacting with, co with uh, consumers or users, the first issue is usually about uh, the pricing. That is uh, the first thing that uh, quality of service and the prices. And uh, as Botswana, the government of Botswana has really been taking the lead in terms of uh, ensuring that there's uh, bandwidth. The government of Botswana invested a lot in uh, both the the works undersea cable, the West African undersea cable, and the East undersea cable. So this is basically uh, government of Botswana investing in the in the two. And uh, with regard to the Universal Service Fund, we we, we don't have the uh, the the fund is here. Mm. What we have is a seed fund that is held by the regulator, but uh, the government is the one which has put a lot of money in terms of uh, investment in the infrastructure. And as a result of this investment in uh, infrastructure, we are now experiencing a, a serious decline in uh, internet costs. From two, in 2011 uh, February, we issued a, a directive as the regulator uh, to the operators that. Uh, uh, the internet cost had to, to go down and that was implemented and uh, right this week another uh, price reduction is taking place as a result of uh, the lending of works in, uh, in Botswana which is now in operation uh, the, there's been a directive from the, uh, the, the main uh, telecoms uh, operator uh, we, we, to the fact that uh, all the ISP should cut down on the, on the internet uh, pricing and this is, has to be implemented this this very week. So we have uh, really been uh, making rules in terms of ensuring that there's a, a rise in the uptake of uh, internet in Botswana. There is uh, a reduction in the cost of inter, uh, in, uh, internet services in Botswana. And um, the other issue really is uh, with regard to still going back on the government. Uh, in Botswana, we have what you call Inteleza 2 project. Inteleza is basically call me. The government of Botswana took it upon itself to... Uh, connect about 100, 200 villages, main villages, uh, in April uh, 2011 on uh, basic voice services and data. So in spite of the fact that, as it is, we, we do not have uh, the Universal Service Fund, which is operational, the government of Botswana is basically filling that void. Uh, 200 villages is major for a population of 2 million people. It's huge. So almost all the major villages in Botswana are covered with uh, basic voice services and data in Botswana. And the government has also uh, started the uh, what you call e-government initiatives mm -hmm. in Botswana. E-government initiatives in Botswana are in operation and these are basically to be delivered online for free, these services by the government of Botswana. We have uh, incorporated ICT education in formal and informal curriculum in Botswana so that uh, we have what you call the tutor net, the education net, which ensures that uh, there is uh, 
computer awareness and literacy right at the elementary learning stages. So from primary school, we have uh, uh, IT literacy uh, training in, Bo in Botswana. This is all fully funded by, by the government. And at, uh, at high school level, uh, we have IT education for students, which is part of uh, the formal curriculum. And the students are, are, are given computers, at least at, at schools, to access and uh, get to use computers. So really, I think it will be an under understatement to say that in Botswana we, have, we still have a high school which does not have access to computers. Almost all high schools in Botswana, which are all high schools in Botswana, are mainly owned by government, and uh, they have access to, to computers. This is not to say that uh, people in the rural areas uh, do not have the challenges with regard to, to IT. We still have a uh, population in the rural areas which does not have access to computers. But as for the young generation, the schools through the Twitter net have uh, provision for uh, the computers and all, all, the, all the like. So, I would say that um, Botswana has made progress in terms of ensuring that uh, basic voice and uh, data each in every corner of Botswana you can access it. In terms of the pricing of the uh, internet services, the prices have been going down uh, significantly over uh, the, last, uh, the last two years. So, going back to the issue of uh, con consumer advocacy, yes, as the, as the regulator will always get complaints from consumers, mainly with regard to pricing and quality of service, and those are always um, addressed. And uh, going back to what uh, my, 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 my colleague says, uh, Abel, is, uh, he cuts both ways. He's uh, an IT expert and also a, a businessman. So when I talk about ensuring that uh, businesses in Botswana, especially SMEs, have access to the internet to contribute to GDP. That is, that is very, very critical. He, I think he runs the biggest uh, transport um, business in Botswana, the biggest passenger transport in Botswana, the biggest. He look, he's young, but uh, he's a very successful businessman. And that basically means for him to, have, to grow his business, he needs access to the internet. That is what I was saying earlier. As Botswana, I can't talk, speak for Africa really. I'll, 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 I'll be exaggerating my importance. But I can speak with authority, with authority with regard to Botswana. As Botswana, we want access to the internet. We want to lower costs on the internet so that we can develop our economy and diversify our economy. That is basically the bottom line. You know, we are running out of time, and I'm going to try to summarize a couple of key things that came across. Um, the, the concerted commitment about the importance of access, I think, was, you know, uh, it's interesting to me that we started, actually, the World Summit on the Information Society was originally supposed to be about ICTs for developing countries. And then we spent four years in a geopolitical debate about who would govern the Internet. The argument about who's going to govern the Internet still continues. But access has remained one of the priority themes in the IGF. And it is evolving in the discussion away from basic discussions about access to more sophisticated discussions and understanding about access, including affordability of devices, and now actually talking also, uh, almost touching in some workshops about the implications related to access to electrical power or, um, or energy in order to support the devices and uh, e-waste issues and environment. So we're seeing, if I think it, about access kind of as it's really evolving in terms of how the focus and interest, but the key commitment remains. But the other thing that came across to me in our panel was the this idea that participation and involvement has to be thought about in, in uh, more like a diamond mm -hmm. with many facets to it. And I hadn't I really hadn't grasped that, I don't think. You know, we tend to come to the IGF and we think about bringing the policy maker and the policy influencer and the policy wonk and the um, civil society and the business and the technical community. We don't have a good mechanism for um, the feedback loop about how we're implementing policy. We don't have enough policy makers involved or enough of all of the other players involved, but there's this new um, aspect that's really coming across to me about how we do 
Um, and I don't think we're going to bring all those people to the IGF. So maybe the question is, how are we going to take the IGF to them? Or how are we going to take the concept of Internet governance to them? Um, and I'm going to look quickly here at um, both Nizar and Jimson and maybe Omar for just a very quick thought here. But it seems to me that we have to, in the IGF, be thinking about how we commercial, no, that's the wrong word, consumerize, I need, I need help guys, consumerize the discussion about internet governance so it feels relevant to people at home. And, I, and one thing I would say is maybe instead of talking about internet governance, we talk about the internet's relationship to privacy or the internet's, govern, the internet, internet's relationship to access or affordable cost or cybersecurity. Maybe our mystical umbrella term of internet governance is confusing when we come out and Nizo, I'm just going to look to you and, and also maybe to um, to Jimson about this this idea that if we're going to be better understood, maybe we need better messaging. Thank you, Marilyn. I, I just want to, but for Amal, uh, please, Amal, this is the logo of the women organization, so it's good to have. Vincent had it yesterday, so I would like to give it to you and put it, he was putting it yesterday, Vincent, it was really nice of him. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So, I, I, uh, as for the internet participation, I, I, I see the IGF in general as, as it is perceived on a national level that there is not a, a clear process who should go, who, who need to attend, and how to attend. And if we can make it from a national level a very clear and transparent process, who can be represented and who should be represented at, the, at these forums. This will make it much easier and much clearer and will minimize the debate about and will give more legitimacy to the meetings taking place in, in a way. This is from a, from a way that we see it. The other issue I want just, uh, uh, the, ICT, the, Indus, the ICT association or the industry associations is a very key player in IG, in, at the IGF as represent, they, do, they are not a civil society organizations. They are an industry association. And what, 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 that, what it is, it's in a way they represent the private sector, but at the same time they are in a midway, they are non, not for profit, which they represent a midway between, like an intermediate between the, the private sector and the civil society. And they have been over, over the time, especially in, count in, in, on a national level, they have been very active in unifying the voice of the industry and the voice of the civil society. And this will get me to the ICT4D activities that our colleague was talking about. This is very important that the activities and the organizations that have been working on ICT4Ds to work with and to take from their experience because they are more in touch with the civil society problems that they, and community problems on a national level and to get more of their experiences. And, to, and, and a lot of social innovation have been done on the, at this level and need and they are most most of them are replicable and expandable and they can grow and I think that we really need to benefit from and and to promote at this as, as for one one last point sorry for taking a little longer than expected about about uh, about what is the best uh, best practices in in term of access and, uh, and law and regulation. We have sometimes uh, like a, a lot of these regulations about using the duct, how the best way for access and share the duct. It has to be taken on also a lot to the national level because there is a lot of incumbent that are coming, that they have they small businesses that have been done over the years that will be heard by, by having licenses for big organizations that will come in and kill all the, the, the national and it, all, it will always ha help in this country to have as simple as it's in the US have a, st a stimulus package for the last mile initiative it will help us as well <laughs> thank you
Jameson, a brief comment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I need to say this, that uh, my pay job is as uh, the CEO of an IT firm in Nigeria and uh, contemporary consulting. I use my resources to really uh, push this, the, the, uh, the, the IC association. I use it to help build it up. So you can't really find many CEO doing that. They are focused on, if I should be in my business, I have a number of projects I'm to be working on, but I said I need, some people need to take uh, the lead. And that is why I'm here. Now, my point is, uh, going, being ITAM president for uh, that time, uh, WITSA, I want to commend WITSA, uh, of course, and GIC for this workshop. WITSA recognized the, the sacrifice and said, okay, yes, we need to deepen uh, participation. And that is why, you know, we were involved in the in number of activities and so, so courtesy, you know, WITSA. Now that we, we, I'm no longer the vice chair for WITSA, there's somebody else, but through AFICTA, I want to continue the process. Now, to reaching the, the, the locality, reaching the people, we need, there's need for more kind of uh, uh, empowerment of local activities. Donors have seen they focus more government agencies, and you know that is it doesn't work as effective as it should. There are a number of other organizations within, uh, of course, uh, private sector led, that there needs to be some form of focus on, to be in terms of uh, diversifying you know participation in this uh, look, uh, global uh, movement. Now uh, in Nigeria, there is, as I said, 30% internet uh, penetration which is about 40% in Africa right now. See, there are a lot of users there. If you cut them off from the internet, you are, you are, you, there will be a lot of issues. So they need to galvanize that low base and bring them in to the discussion. So uh, this will enrich the process. Thanks. We've really run out of time, and I know we, uh, we're going to miss a closing comment from our uh, other folks, but I am going to turn to them and ask them if they have an uh, urgent comment that they want to make before we wrap up. This is like pushing a boulder up a hill. It takes a long time. Just keep that in mind. Thank you. <laughs> but, but, I, but I know he meant that very positively. It's a beautiful boulder. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll put it a slightly different way. Hillary, Hillary Clinton used to, say, used to say, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes multi-stakeholder approach to get better access and to accelerate access around the world. And so I think that everything we're doing here is exceedingly important. As an implementer, we feel the effects every day because we have to take practical and pragmatic approaches. And so we're looking for um, internet governance to lead the charge in, in really creating, the, helping drive the right policies and environments so we can use innovation, use technology, and use local capacity development, and use risk capital from um, organizations like USAID to really show what can be done. And so uh, it's great to be here and hear from every side what, can, what, what, we, what we can do. Thanks, Marilyn. Uh, one thing I would say, um, talking about both pushing a boulder um, up a hill and multi-stakeholderism, is thinking about who's not in the room, who's not here, and getting them here. And or as you know, as one of the panelists said earlier, uh, getting us to them because that's a huge issue. So I'm going to just sum up by saying that um, through my conversation with all of you and. Uh, in conversation in particular with Shauna, we were uh, talking about this concept of parallel universes. And I already knew how parallel the universe experience was from living through the first phases of the WISIS when governments were in the room talking about the internet and business and technical community and civil society were nowhere to be found. We weren't even allowed in the room. So we brought those parallel universes together really through the four weeks. I think the for four years. I think, though, that I'm thinking today that there are more parallel universes that we need to be um, finding some nexus with if we're going to be really effective at achieving the outcomes envisioned in the Tunis agenda, not only in access but in the other areas as well. Thank you all for joining us. There will be a transcript, by the way, that will be posted.
And for any of you, I do want to commend two documents that WITSA has made available, and Anders has copies of them, if you're interested in both their policy action document and a statement on policy on Internet governance. The latter one you may find particularly interesting. It shares their views about um, the upcoming um, uh, issues related to an Internet treaty. Thank you all for coming and joining.